And so Ursula von der Leyen, she said, she made a statement that is so to the point. She said, it doesn't make sense for the EU to build that perfect road between a Chinese financed copper mine and a Chinese financed harbor. No, it may not make sense for the EU to build that road, but for an African government, it may make perfect sense. But that th that then shows that for the EU, the, the, the idea of African agency, sovereignty, autonomy, that is a very foreign idea, an alien idea that the EU doesn't like. And so it comes with this strategic autonomy a talk to counter that, saying that the EU needs a neighborhood of friendly states, and our Africa is certainly in that neighborhood. Um, and that's just old fashioned uh, <laughs> spheres of influence. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal, and today I'm joined by a Swedish academic who did some very important work on a topic that I wanted to explore for a while, namely the colonial past of the European Union and what its geopolitical intentions for Africa now might be. I'm speaking to Dr. Peo Hansen, who's a professor of political science at Sweden's Linköping University. His research focuses, among other things, on European integration, migration, political economy and geopolitics. Dr. Hansen is the author of several books, including Your Africa, The Untold History of European Integration and Colonialism, of which there is also an academic article, and recently he wrote a short magazine article as well. All of this will be linked in the description. Professor Hansen, Peo, welcome. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for taking the time and for writing this great article, which is what I would like us to focus on a bit, because um, in it you wrote something that I think needs to be understood better about the EU, because the EU is often portrayed as a peace project. But the big problem you write is that this foundational tale of innocent origins, untamed by ugly geopolitical concerns, does not stand historical scrutiny. Can you expand on that? Yes, I will. First of all, let me let me say that the book on Euro Africa I have co-authored with Stefan Jonsson, it's my 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 colleague. So it's a co co-authored uh, work. Yes, we have a narrative that has been very successfully disseminated by the European Union throughout time. We should say so from from inception, uh, the EU has been very sort of yeah successful in in. Uh, disseminating the narrative that it's a peace project, it's an anti, deeply anti-geopolitical project. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, power, uh, politics, with the projection of power. Um, and it wants to do something altogether new in world affairs. Yet, when you look at the history uh, of the European project, it, it, when, you look, when you scratch the surface, uh, you see that it's actually quite the contrary. The EU was deeply implicated in geopolitical matters, both things that it didn't control, the project didn't control, and things that it indeed controlled, like African colonialism, and other things that it tried to, to gain control over, meaning the Cold War logic. So when it comes to colonialism, you know, the European Union, uh, again, like because it was founded after the Second World War and it was founded right when, you know, decolonization was 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 was, you know, getting started. And, you know, the Europeans today, they, they like to remember this as, you know, when they finally had learned their lesson and they let go with like few minor exceptions. But I think especially the minor exceptions are quite important. And also the 50s and 60s are very important as an overlap with like old colonialism, not just neo-colonialism, but old colonialism. Can you can you maybe tell us what are the main what are the main colonial pasts of the European Union? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's important to understand too that after the Second World War, there's a series of efforts at European integration, some of them successful, some of them not. So uh, there's the Council of Europe and there's NATO. NATO was considered an organization for European integration at the time, which is forgotten today. And there's the Council of Europe, as I said. Then there is the, the attempt. There's OEC, today's OECD. 
Uh, there is the attempt to, to forming a European army and the European defense community and the European political community. And before that, in 1950, 51, there's, of course, the European coal and steel community, which is the predecessor to today's EU, then founded in 1957 in the Treaty of, of, of Rome. So what the EU tries to do and what it works on, different integration projects, different integration actors, they try to conserve and develop colonialism. And of course, Asia was gone. And they are very clear about that, that when, when India, Pakistan and, and, and Indochina, Indonesia and, and, and so on, uh, when, that, uh, uh, when that decolonization happens, uh, Asia is not really on the map of the European integrationists, but Africa is indeed. So Africa is always talked about as the, the, the Europe's sort of last chance at revival, at post-war revival, because what, what they, what they uh, see and what, what, what they realize is that, look, Europe, the European continent in itself, is divided between the two uh, superpowers now, the US and the Soviet Union. Yet Europe still owns Africa. And the Cold War takes a while for it to, to penetrate the African continent. I mean, Egypt and Suez crisis, that's really the, the, the first big one. But other than that, the Europeans feel, and they, they make that very clear in newspapers and, and, and journals and so on, make that clear too, that that time is still speaking for the European project in Africa. So they try to have Europe and Africa form Eurafrica as a third geopolitical bloc in world politics. And that was already an idea that was sort of, uh, that, 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 that some people came up with all, already before the, the First World War. Who championed that, that idea? Was it the French? The that's also a, a misunderstanding because the easy way here is to say, look, this was, this was just France. France, of course, could not join a trade and tariffs and <laughs> union with, with a huge empire not sort of dealt with. And so France made it clear early on that if we're going to have uh, the European uh, economic community, today's EU in 1957, it made an ultimatum saying we will have to have our French Union, our empire in the in the project. And Belgium said the same thing about Congo uh, and Rwanda and Urundi. And, but what's important here, and again, scratching the surface, uh, reading the, the, the zeitgeist at the time, West Germany is very, very much interested in this. Uh, and uh, so, and that is also uh, an effect of the Cold War that Konrad Adenauer and others, they just don't like the way Europe has been divided. They are very uncertain about Anglo-American intentions for the defense of, of Germany and West Germany. And so West Germany feels that the future lies with the, with the French and the French empire. And it sees all these amazing potential, uh, industrial potential, raw material, uh, and and the wealth. And I mean, we have to understand that the Suez crisis is uh, is uh, very important here because that meant the first big energy crisis. H help me, nineteen fifty six. Yes, sorry, right. sorry. So that's just one year, or basically five months prior to the signing of the Treaty of Rome. And the, the the I mean, and that is the big. You can say that the Suez crisis marks the end of taking for granted sovereignty in Africa, for at least in North Africa, for uh, the French and the British. They do this behind the back of Eisenhower and the U.S., and that greatly angers the the American administration, and they stop it together with the, with the with the Soviet Union. Ironically enough. And that shows West Germany, it shows Western Europe, this, its statesmen, that look, we don't have the, the sort of sovereignty and autonomy externally as we used to. 
but we still have the French uh, uh, Empire in Africa. And so that sort of facilitated the, the Treaty of Rome and the geopolitical aspect of integration. Yeah, and the Treaty of Rome then in 57, it creates this, the EEC, and then it that it incorporates also the, the, the territories in Africa, right? right? All of Algeria, Congo for Belgium and so on, they become part actually of the EEC framework, like legally. So the EU incorporates yeah. parts of Africa. One more question though. Um, at the same time, there's this other this this other thing going on, especially for like for the French, the the second Indo the, the Indochina Wars, right? The mm -hmm. and the handover of Vietnam from the French to the Americans, or the replacement of French troops by American troops. Uh, can you explain a little bit how that plays into the the situation? Now it's getting complex here, but let's go back then to the French Indochina War because that's really significant too for European integration. Um, Although it's not talked about, it's not it's not done in that way for in, in most most scholarship, but that was France's attempt to yeah to 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 keep Indochina and the Brits helped France because uh, Indochina was occupied by Japan during the war, and so it after uh, after the war the the Brits they helped France recapture just like they helped. Uh, the Dutch recapture uh, Indonesia. So France then enters the war with Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnam, Viet Minh forces. And that goes on to, to 54 with the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Then everything is, is lost. And as you said, Americans take over. But this coincides with the negotiations for the European defense community and the European mm -hmm. army. And there's one dissertation at Lund University by Jasmine Aymak, and she turns that whole story around because it has previously been thought that France didn't want the European defense community because it was afraid of Germany. And it didn't well, it was want... France, it was France that sank the, the, yes. sank the project, yeah, in the end. Yeah. But what Jasmine Aymak does is that she's, she asked the question, did France pursue the European defense community for Europe or for the empire. Mm. And she concludes, I think, very convincingly that it pursued it for empire. It pursued it basically totally to keep the Americans bankroll and support the war in Indochina. Once the war was over, the Fran French could go back and say, we don't need the European defense community. So it's a brilliant diplomatic sort of game played by the French, keeping American the Americans thinking that France would just have to finish the war. Then they would commit to a European defense community. But it was the other way around. France just took the money and the, the American effort for as long as it lasted. And then the European defense community was, was history. So again, mm -hmm. an incredibly global geopolitics around the European defense community that we usually just assume is a strictly European Cold War story, but it's a global story. And, and that is that is not really understood in EU scholarship. I mean, that makes that makes good sense, because I mean, the the, the core element of the European unity, the, the coal and steel community and the EEC was this marriage of the former enemies of France and Germany, which is why, in my opinion, the EU will exist as long as these two are part of it. Um, it can it can like others can go out. If one of these two goes out, it's it's done with with the project. Yeah. But um the, especially France. France was trying to to still keep on to to the empire it had and get it back from from what was lost during the war. The British they didn't they they were they had too much war debt, so the Americans uh, twisted their arms to let go of of a good part of it, not out of ult, um, altruistic uh, motives, but because of like replacement. But the French were different, and for a very long time up until now, a good some African countries have their money printed in France, don't they? Yes, yeah, and there was a fantastic book out uh, just recently uh, by Ndongo Samba Sulla, and I forgot uh, the the, the co-author's name, but it's it's about the CFR franc. Yes, the colonial currency that still is the 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 currency of I think sixteen 
African countries and in West Africa and Central Africa. Again, a remnant of, and the, the irony there, as is, as is uh, told in this book, is of course that when France joined the, the Euro, it lost its national currency. And so <laughs> the French franc or the African franc survived and is now connected to the Euro. So it's now pegged to the Euro instead of the, of the French franc. So it has become a, an EU project, you could say, in, in some way, although France is very much in, in control still. Yeah, there are all these remnants uh, that we don't pay attention to, but are that, that are very, very significant. Can we maybe talk also a little bit about the war in Algeria, which was a very, very bloody war, like Algeria's war of independence. Yeah. Uh, and that was an intra- EEC war. I mean, this was territory that was officially under the treaties part of the EEC. So what do you make out of that one? Or how did it impact the way that the EU then now, yeah. back then and now, is kind of interacting with North Africa? Indeed. And that's that's how the, 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 the okay, the Vietnam War ends with the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. And then basically the, the Algerian War of Independence, or as it was seen at the back then from the French perspective, a war of secession, uh, an illegal war and so on. But that's in 1954, the Algeria uh, war starts. And of course, that is then impacting once the negotiations for the for the European uh, economic community starts, that war is is sort of hoovering over the the the, the whole the whole uh, uh, project. And what France wants to do there, it's sort of wobbly. It 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 cannot make up its mind uh, uh, at first, but then it decides that it wants to incorporate Fran uh, Algeria totally into the territorial uh, 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 European community. The other colonies are associated, which is a a, a, a looser fit, a looser form of of incorporation, you could say, but Algeria, since it was part part of France, uh, the French Re Republic, it was totally incorporated, and there is also a new book on that by Megan Brown, and she explains that as one of the reasons for France wanting to incorporate it was because that was it, it, the same thing as having the other countries, uh, the other five countries uh, legitimizing the French war and the claim from France that Algeria was indeed France and should not should not be uh, allowed to secede. And Adenauer was was one of the staunchest supporters of the Algerian war and the right for France to keep Algeria. So it played it played in uh, to to a to a yeah, a, to, to a great extent. I mean, it was very, very important. And of uh, course, I was talking about Suez and the energy crisis, oil crisis uh, following in its wake. And what happened in 56, which is very important, is that they strike big oil uh, and gas deposits in the Sahara Desert in Algeria. And for West Germany and others, and the, the newspaper headlines is they 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 have many of those saying look europe can now be energy independent uh, so it, that also of course resonates with our time about uh, the geopolitics of energy and so france and west germany and others realized look if we can hold on to algeria we have oil and gas enough for probably to sustain the entire uh, energy need of Western Europe. And that was huge. So the New York Times was saying, you know, Europe could de-link from Mideast oil and then be instead controlling its own oil reserves in Algeria. Yeah, in a, in a weird way, the, the Europe, the continent, um, except for Russia and, and, and Norway and uh, and Japan, they have the same problem. They are not energy uh, self sufficient. They 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 constantly need to look for more. The only, I mean, really, the, the Norwegians are the only ones who kind of who, who sit on enough carbohydrates to to yeah. supply themselves. The rest needs to go looking for it outside. Um, were there other instances when carbohydrates played a 
part of the EU's or the EEC's like geopolitical um, thinking? I don't have it on top of my head, but uh, definitely other raw materials. And that's why one of the big reasons why Africa was so attractive to tea in colonial form. Uh, so, and again, the, the Europeans were mesmerized by, because Africa's resources at this time is are largely untapped still. Um, so they think this this is uh, it's just lying there waiting the all the different uh, rare uh, raw ma raw materials and, and and so on and and german companies german industry they keep all these these meetings with the french uh, uh, to to see what how they can come in and explore and exploit resources in africa and, you know, then in the 60s, we, we see this shift going on from like classical colonialism, where you directly control countries to neo-colonialism, which is basically just make sure that your companies have access to all of these markets and control the, well, control everything except for, for, the, for politics, because politics you can control through bribes and so on. Could you explain a little bit the, or give us a couple of examples for how the EU or EU countries shifted uh, to neo-colonialism? Yeah. I mean, Stefan and I, in our book, we sort of, because that is a sort of, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a difficult thing to explain. On the one hand, you could say, ostensibly, your Africa failed because decolonization happened. And your Africa indeed relied to a large extent on old style, total control sort of uh, colonialism. It could not really deal with independence, uh, self-determination and those things. It was, it was not part of that. Yet, what your Africa did was to get the association agreement uh, 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 on, on uh, moving, you could say. So in 1957, there were no signing of an associate, association agreement because these countries were, were colonies, right? They were territories. So the Europeans, they associated these countries. Then they became independent. And then in 1963, they signed this time an association agreement in Yahunde, the Yahunde uh, agreement. And that agreement then became, you could say, the what we... We, we we call your Africa a vanishing mediator. So your Africa has vanished, but it continues to mediate Euro-African relations. And it does that then through the Yaoundé agreement with 18 newly independent uh, African, nominal, nominally independent African countries. And so continues the sort of dependency, colonial, but now neo-colonial relationship without there being this this your african dream anymore so it's it's really your africa and the had let's say that that the eu had been formed in 1965 then i think those relations may have looked quite different uh, but it's it is for, founded in 1957 and at that time there was really no no one anticipating African independence, as to, as in French and Belgium, uh, th that was if you read newspapers from that time, it's basically for the, for the next generations. African colonialism it will stay, and those who commented at the time of the Rome Treaty just said that, oh, no one could anticipate in 1960 and then later and then on onwards that all these countries will become independent. So 57 is an interesting year. It's, it's sort of like 1988 or 87. No one anticipates the fall of the Berlin Wall, but this, this happens and then the relationships are renegotiated, but they're renegotiated in a way that relies on the original association with colonies. So that's Stop. how neo-colonialism works in this case. And then so, something that strikes me then is that we have now, you know, a historical case studies of one group of countries, geographical, that relatively closely adhered to, let's call it neoliberal orthodoxy, meaning uh, liberalizing economies and and uh, doing everything that World Bank and IMF 
basically have in their in all of their rule books. And that's a lot of African countries. And we have the counter example of basically all the successful East and Southeast Asian countries, first and foremost, Singapore, and then later also uh, China, once it got out of its of its communism uh, uh, ideals, uh, but also Japan and Taiwan and so on, they all they all didn't do the IMF and, and World Bank uh, prescriptions, and they did protect their local industries, and they did build up local industries, whereas in Africa that never happened. And I've talked to an African scholar who says, like, you, we're still being treated as... Uh, as raw material suppliers. We don't even have the markets. The, these raw materials are not even traded <laughs> inside the African countries. They're traded outside. So um, how is it that de decolonization happened politically, but economically not for the African case? No. No, I mean, I, it, the books, uh, the, the work done on the Yaoundé uh, uh, agreement, they are quite... There's a consensus there saying this is neo-colonialism. The, the, the newly independent 18 African countries did not have a position to really negotiate in a real way. They basically had to just go along with whatever the Europeans told them. Um, and with that, of course, came then access to markets. There were certain benefits for African uh, uh, newly in independent countries too but nothing close to how it benefited uh, uh, Europe. So those, and then of course, here's France role in, in steering a lot of what the European Commission did. Uh, it, it's, it's, there's been a lot of written about that too, that, that confirms how, how rigged this EU-Africa relations were and how rigged they were in, in, in the sense that France uh, pull the strings to a large, large degree. Yes, and then, then in the seventies things change a bit. Uh, so, the agreement, uh, the Lomé agreement, struck in the early seventies. Uh, that that's a, this is not my field of 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 scholarship. So I'm just referring to what 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 those who study that, but what what they have concluded, and they say that. That's the time when we discuss global economic issues in very different terms. And so the Lomé in 1974 is a different animal from what has uh, happened before. And there's much more ac ac activism and agency on the African side. And it goes together with a sort of new economic policies addressing these issues. And then of course they would be severely, like you already said, they would be severely um, damaged by then the the, the neoliberal uh, and and policies of the IMF and structural adjustment and, and and all of that. So, what what could have taken a different development in the early seventies because the EU was very different back then too. I mean, the EU was very had a lot of left sort of uh, uh, there was a lot of leftist influence from 68 and so on mm. um, and so, so there, there was a a, a a moment there but since then it's been and right now of course it is very different in the sense that the eu wants to pursue very extractive policies and so on but now it has competition like i i note in this in this lsc blog uh, uh post that China, of course, is a, is a big adversary in Africa for the Europeans, an adversary they never really had. Um, yeah, and the, there's another one coming, and that's the that's the Russians. I had yeah. a I have a Russian uh, 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 colleague journalist who wrote a short piece for my blog, and she said, like, look, the African countries look quite benignly at Russia because the Soviet Union never had that direct control. It was always more of a partnership, and that's something that African countries today remember, especially now that some African countries, I mean, we've seen what happened in, in um, uh, Nigeria the, uh, the, the, uh, two months ago, right? Nigeria is throwing out the French and is now even telling the Americans to leave, although um, they won't do that because they don't. Um, yeah. But um, how do you see that now playing out? Is there another scramble for Africa happening in front of our eyes? It's been going on for quite 
quite a while, actually. And what, what I find interesting is that on the one hand, we know the scramble of Africa and we know that the horrendous negative effects that ha that 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 has on Af many African countries. On the other hand, though, there is also something new, which wasn't there before, and that's African agency to a larger degree, being able to to sort of like like you said the word partnership, being able to choose sometimes who they cooperate with. So governments in Africa, they are they are less sort of just being pulled by by Europeans like they used to. And that is hugely new. And that's that's a, a scandal for the Europeans. They cannot accept that. And that's the whole language, the whole policy rhetoric that they have on Africa now is saying the Chinese, the Russians, uh, also other other uh, uh, players coming into the african scene that the eu think is is uh, yeah it, it 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 shouldn't shouldn't be like that because the europeans is africa's natural partner as it always says and you say well natural partner i don't yeah maybe but it's certainly not a good partnership and it hasn't really been a real partnership it's been a very as asymmetric relationship as we all know and so Ursula von der Leyen, she said, she made a statement that is so to the point. She said, it doesn't make sense for the EU to build that perfect road between a Chinese financed copper mine and a Chinese financed harbor. No, it may not make sense for the EU to build that road, but for an African government, it may make perfect sense. But that th that then shows that for the EU, the, the, the idea of African agency, sovereignty, autonomy, that is a very foreign idea, an alien idea that the EU doesn't like. And so it comes with this strategic autonomy uh, talk to counter that, saying that the EU needs a neighborhood of friendly states, and our Africa is certainly in that neighborhood. Um, and that's just old-fashioned uh, <laughs> spheres of influence policy, and it's so obvious in the uh, in the EU Africa relations these days that sort of EU is doubling down on failed uh, policy and cannot cannot realize that African governments these days they have some leverage and they will use that and they will not just take. Uh, uh, orders from from Brussels and from from EU capitals anymore. That's so a that, very that is true. that's a very that's a very valuable valuable observation. It's just what my worry is that historically speaking, what happens in these moments is that these old ways of thinking they double down even further and even harder and try to try to really break things uh, yeah. if if you can't get it uh, peacefully. So, yeah. do, 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 what do you think France will be? doing now that it's being kicked out of a good part of uh, north uh, northwestern africa um are we are we anyhow there was there was talk even about an intervention and what i see recently is the french tried it and i think the americans too they tried to talk to nigeria as a local leader to basically you know intervene and in in northern africa and also intervene in haiti Two times it yeah. didn't happen. It didn't happen. But there is an there's an impetus to try to you know divide and conquer again, right? With with certain is elected allies. Yeah, I think when you said intervention, uh, that was in the air for for quite some time, and I think the way Western media talked about that was as if this was the most natural thing <laughs> that could happen. We just assume, oh, the French will intervene, and maybe with the help of the U.S. And um, yeah, most of the coups they are <laughs> trained by the U.S. and so on. There are all these 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 complex relationships here, but it didn't happen, and it's interesting. Um, so I think, yeah, th there's a lot of lot of uh, sort of contingency plans here here made here, and I think also. From this, the the the, the EU's geopolitical sort of sense, 
what the EU is saying openly about Africa is that there are many places in Africa where the US doesn't have any primary interests. And those are the places where the, that the EU needs to capitalize on from the sort of more military perspective, I mean, security uh, uh, policy perspective. And that's also interesting because that 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 is a, a, a throwback from the 50s when the when the when France and West Germany and so on, when they say, look, the US and the Soviet Union, they have no sort of real interests. I mean, the US hardly had any embassies in Africa at the time. Uh, or, or sort of interest points of of interest, and um, that so so it, it's it's coming again that the EU needs to to move fastly in those areas where they will not have any sort of issue with it, with US uh, interests, and but then they run up against other countries' interests like China or Russia or yeah many other Gulf states what what have you. And I think that is harder for the EU, EU to um, accept. And that's why we have a very aggressive language towards China. Uh, for, uh, the EU has developed a, a very aggressive language towards um, China in, in Africa. And when Josef Borrell, the foreign policy chief of the EU, when he, when he uh, visited China in, in, the, in the autumn, I think it was in October or November last year, he insisted to the Chinese that China should treat the EU as a geopolitical peer. And, and that is, of course, a weird sort of claim to make. You are either geopolitical and then your adversaries will treat you like that. But you cannot sort of rhetorically try to convince another and, and your adversaries to treat you like you are mighty and powerful. So, so it's it's like the, the EU would never do that like that to the to the Americans, but they they do it to the Chinese and the Russians. There's still so much hubris. This is something that then you know that that especially realists we we we, we react kind of allergically to that uh, when when you see that the rhetoric <laughs> doesn't match the deeds, doesn't match the actual power relation. Um, maybe you know china is so interesting because what we are seeing coming from europe and from also from the united states is a lot of weird new jargon one of the weird ones that happened oh, five six seven years ago was the that the eu and the the us is is um is telling everybody that oh be careful of the debt trap china's debt trap china's debt trap which the debt trap is, of course, exactly what allowed neocolonialism to work so beautifully for 50, 60 years, right? Because you can squeeze these countries based upon making them indebted in your own currency so that, you know, that that and then structural readjustment, which is just another word for like, I'm going to tell you what what you have to implement politically in your in your country. The new a new word is like Chinese overcapacity. Janet, yeah, Janet Yellen uh, used that saying like China needs to curb its overcapacity and its its aggressive exports into the world. <laughs> what do you make out of that? Again, that I know uh, too little about to say something uh, profound. I I I I guess, but but I I I think you have a a point here. Um, to to that rhetoric coming now, I don't think that is uh, is is a co coincidence. Um, last question, where do you see the European Union going? Um, do you think it will it itself try to be more geopolitical? Because it, it said that. I mean, the last last uh, commission said they want to be a geopolitical commission. And everybody was like, why? Because like the image, the stereotype is like you're an economical union and you're a peace project. And now suddenly Ursula von der Leyen says like, no, we want to be geopolitical. Do you think this will continue? Or do you think the pressure will be there to to go to, to walk that back a bit? Yeah, that is the eighteen thousand dollar question, right? Uh, there are different sort of tendencies, contradictory tendencies, and what we also have to understand is that the European Union, since at least Eastern enlargement, uh, has contained and and does contain different geopolitical wills. 
and we see that and we see it although every so many try to downplay it or ignore it but we see that in in U the ukraine war of course different countries have different interests here and then of course a country like france macron now who took a different position early on but now he's he's arguing boots on the ground and doubling down and and, and so on but i think <sighs> I think when you have leaders in the EU like Macron or like Ursula von der Leyen and others saying that the veto on foreign policy has to go, it's anachronistic, it's it's ridiculous, and they, they say it has to go. And then you have scholars like uh, filling in saying that we need to, it's how can Europe, Europe needs to speak with one, one voice and so on. But that again goes back to old old dreams of european unit unity that are very dangerous because all that implies is that certain governments will speak for europe france germany maybe a few that would hook up with their with their uh, and then a bunch of countries who would just follow along like sweden um but it still shows how fragile this project is, and that's why how dangerous it is. That's where why where, where history's lessons should be it should should be 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 taught, right? My perspective of the EU has always been that it shouldn't experiment too much, particularly not with foreign and security military policies. Because we've done that in the past and it hasn't worked out. If there's one thing we should remember about Europe is that it it can go awfully wrong. So what I'm looking more more, what I'm taking a greater interest in more and more is to look at what happened in the 60s and uh, 70s. When you had strong European voices, they spoke in the name of Europe, but they spoke for peace in the real sense. Olaf Palme, uh, Kreisky. Willy Brandt. Willy yeah, Brandt. Others. Yeah. People who were implicated in the in the great sort of geopolitical schemes at the time, but still argued that there could be alternatives. And alternatives that wasn't just a European alternative, but involved Europe engaging with the non-aligned world and not just giving them orders, but actually truly engaging. And what is so interesting, when you hear those uh, Europeans speak uh, back back in, in, in those times, is that they could speak as Europeans and saying that there's no problem with Europe being weak in the geopolitical sense. We just have to work for engagement, disarmament, a peace movement, all these things uh, that you don't hear anymore. It, it was just that that sort of uh, uh, era when a lot of Europeans were just quite fine with not being geopolitical. Uh, but that time in EU scholarship and in EU parlance, that time period, what is that described as? Well, that's Euro pessimism. That's Euro sclerosis. Those are the bad old days when Europe couldn't do anything. No, I, I would claim that those years are probably the best years if we want to go back and look for alternatives. What did Willy Brandt say in the late 60s? He said he didn't like the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, but he said, we have to coexist. There is no other way. We have to engage and we have to work for to 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 uh, uh, to disarm and to uh, to really en engage and not this aggression that we see today, this ag aggressive sort of policies and and uh, confrontation and zero sum or like the moralizing sort of high ground always uh, the non realistic dangerous policies that we see today. So I think that Europe should reconnect to those. To those days and see what we did we do then and and how could that be be sort of at least articulated today to form new uh, uh movements that would look that that would look at europe not as this 
coming back to war, coming back to confrontation with 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 Russia and 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 China and, and so on. Uh, so I think, if I make sense, that that's that's that, that's that that would be the sort of way for Europe to to uh, engage with the world in a new way. Because the way it's going now is very dangerous. I'm I'm very very skeptical to. I mean, I, my own country was just drawn into to NATO without knowing anything of what is what is what is really going on and what what is what the implications are, and and so these these are very are very dangerous uh, uh, times. And the way the European leadership is handling it is 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 it's just awful to watch. I cannot remember a time when European integration happened with an with an with an ideology that came along with 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 uh, uh, you know wanting to exert control over everybody when that didn't go horribly wrong every time that happened it went very very wrong and be it the soviet union be it be it nazi germany and be it also like the french approach 200 years ago of saying like yeah we just we just going to unite everything uh, with uh, with weapons every single time and it broke apart again and it's usually nationalism that breaks it apart just yeah um yeah it's a realization that there could that there can be different in interests and with africa like i said that is a foreign idea that african countries could have different interests and that they will actually pursue different interests from those of of, of europe and, and brussels and that it can be okay and we can coexist yeah. exactly yeah P.O. hansen thank you very much for your time today thank you thanks for, being, for having me Thank you.